You know, the time of Omar bin Khattab, we have uh, historical uh, data that shows that people from Horn Africa actually engaged in piracy and sacked Jeddah of all places, especially the, the people of the Beja, uh, which is uh, the Cushitic the peoples that live mostly in the um, the Ethiopian uh, highlands and, and sorry, the Ethiopian borderlands uh, between Sudan and Ethiopia. So we can continue seeing that. And then even when the, 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 they try to push back and they want to sort of, OK, put this piracy um, on, 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 on hold, one of the th crucial things that happens is the, the, the encouragement is so that it's not a fatoria, it's not a conquest. You don't go to Abd al Habash for that purpose, but you rather push them back and make sure that the piracy doesn't have this uh, deadly effect that it had on the Red Sea or the, the Red um, Coast of that channel. But that we just, okay, once that is pushed back, we do not go further in. See that the Sahaba, the Tabi'in, the Tab'a Tabi'in, the, the Umayyad Empire, the first uh, kingdom, the first Muslim kingdoms, and then the following in the Abbasid, none of them actually violated those. Uh, um, uh, orders as a were, those understanding. None of them continued, none of them acted on all the Fatuhat and all the conquests and all the uh, putting down rebellions and all the um, uh, seeking uh, um, land taxations because some of these kingdoms, some of these Muslim dynasties and empires, they were not noble themselves, right? They engaged in acts that was just purely economic. They, they engaged in not necessarily that. But nonetheless, nonetheless, with even that, they followed that uh, uh, sort of uh, quote unquote diplomatic relations that the Prophet set in place and they followed along. So nobody actually even pushed that on. And you could see this lesson in, in, in that history, which we just mentioned with the piracy. Uh, the Sahawa and the Tabi'in that came in, they engaged with these pirates, but they always pushed them back and never came with them. One of the things about the East African, uh, the Horn of Africa or the East African realms is that it has a very early history of Islam and a very lengthy, in fact, tradition when it comes to the different dynasties, the Sultanates, the Imamates, uh, dating back to the 7th century in some cases, but it's very seldom mentioned when we talk of the great dynasties of Islam. We think of the Seljuk, we think of the Ottomans, we think of the Abbasids, the Umayyads. Uh, even in North Africa, we have various different um, dynasties. But very seldom we talk of, for example, the Sultanates of Somalia or Sultanates in Somalia, um, and in particular in Mogadishu. So tell us a bit more about Marodishu in terms of the history and is the Islamic legacy in that region. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Salatu Salam ala Rasulillah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um I'm about first and foremost Jazakallah Khair for having me uh, once more, uh, Brother Ibrahim, and your uh, beautiful effort in always trying to bring out the hidden gems of what is our history, our ulama the experiences and everything that they've left behind, but that was, you know, re uh, remained for a long time un unexplored, unstudied, uh, made it a, like a sort of a back backdrop <laughs> in footnotes in many cases. So thank you for doing that and always taking those efforts. And I know it's very hard to, you know, Mm, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says, those who do not thank Allah Subhanahu those who do not thank the people have not thanked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So for that, I would just want to say Jazakallah Khair for doing this effort. Um, just to quickly dive into the question of, um, if I remember correctly, what's the historical significance of the Horn of Africa in early Islamic history in general? It is a, a sort of um, double-edged sword in that sense, because in one way we know, subhanAllah, from the prophet era, that it was so critical, it was so important that he sent what the ulama of uh, Sira has have quantitated as two thirds of his followers. So literally the largest junk of his followers was sent to the Horn of Africa to seek refuge. 
And this was not done anywhere else in the Hejaz. It was not done anywhere around the corner, nor even the kingdoms in uh, Yemen would, would be closer, nor anywhere in Syria, which would be also closer because of the trade and everything, nor the Persian Empire. But the, the crossing over that channel, that Red Sea, was much more um, uh, important. And so therefore the critical importance of that part of the world uh, in early Islam is already immediately uh, established in, in through the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Sira. And it's maybe the first junk of the Sira that we study when the Prophet is born, how he was born, the Amal feel and all of that stuff. This, these episodes keep coming back and back. And, however, it's never the main picture, you know, it's never the main picture that we see. Um, so continuing on from that, uh, almost immediately then we see throughout the era of the Khulafa al Rashidin, you know, the, uh, the ideas of when the Muslims are going for the Futuhat, the conquest and the Maghazi as they were called early days. One of the significant lessons is you do not conquer the Horn of Africa. You do not go to Ard al-Habasha because, you know, Ard al-Habasha in essence is what we today know as the Horn of Africa. So you do not go and conquer Ard al-Habasha. Why? Because there is a, 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 a different image there. There's a brotherhood there. There is a, 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 what we today see in the allied world of the Western world where, you know, the England and the US type of relationship that they have. And you can equate the similar type of relationships, subhanAllah, at that era. So you can see from there the importance. And that is not only the political importance, but it's also the trade that develops, the, the, the contacts of human in, uh, exchange that uh, continues on. So it's not only, you know, the time of the Najash, it's not only the time of um, uh, uh, the spread of Islam, but it keeps building on, it, even to the point when troubles uh, come from the Horn of Africa and spill over to the Hejaz. You know, the time of Umar bin Khattab, we have uh, historical uh, data that shows that people from the Horn of Africa actually engaged in piracy and sacked Jeddah of all places, especially the, the people of the Beja, uh, which is uh, the, the Cushitic peoples that live mostly in the um, the Ethiopian uh, highlands and, and sorry, the Ethiopian borderlands uh, between Sudan and Ethiopia. So we can continue seeing that. And then even when the, 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 they try to push back and they want to sort of, okay, put this piracy um, on 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 hold. One of the th crucial things that happens is the, the the encouragement is so that it's not a fatwa, it's not a conquest. You don't go to Abd al Habash for that purpose, but you rather push them back and make sure that the piracy doesn't have this uh, deadly effect that it had on the Red Sea or the, the Red um, Coast of that channel, but that we just, okay, once that is pushed back, we do not go further in. So the significance, it's really engaged on to the point that the first geographers of the Muslims, like, you know, um, Al-Yaqubi and those who were before him, uh, Khawarzimi, and um, uh, I think it was, um, uh, al, al um, uh, Fazari, uh, they mentioned the crucial importance that that land piece played. And you see in the geography, early geography, the maps that the Muslims have made, it is specifically you see Ard al Habasha, you see Zayla, you see Braber, you see Waqwaq, you see uh, Mogadishu, and you see it attached to it is some sort of a trade, uh, some sort of an. Um, uh, the things that people actually uh, needed from there and the export and uh, constantly this keeps coming back and that's why we see in the in the middle ages the the third fourth century the hijra becomes constant the people engaging in those in those lands so i don't know whether that answers the question but the significance cannot be stressed uh, more or cannot be stressed enough but unfortunately it's not been uh, uh, studied well enough until sort of recent times so you mentioned some interesting things here <clears throat> one of them being that there was literally a state policy initiated at the time of the prophet وسلم, that forbade the muslim armies from invading and attacking east africa was that only for the muslim enclaves or was it just east africa in general 
specifically some of the narration is specifically related to the Habasha. Uh, there is also an, uh, some other narrations um, that also pop up, which is related to the Turk Turkish people. Uh, but specifically, the one that you could see that the Sahaba, the Tabi'in, the Tab'a Tabi'in, the, the Umayyad Empire, the first uh, kingdom, the first Muslim kingdoms, and then the following and the Abbasid, none of them actually violated those uh, um, uh, orders as a way, those understanding. None of them continued, none of them acted on all the Futuhat, on all the conquests, and all the uh, putting down rebellions and all of the um, uh, seeking uh, um, land taxations because mm -hmm. some of these kingdoms, some of these Muslim dynasties and empires, they were not noble themselves, right? Mm -hmm. They engaged in acts that was just purely economic. They, they engaged in not necessarily that. But nonetheless, nonetheless, with even that, they followed that uh, uh, sort of uh, quote unquote diplomatic relations that the Prophet ﷺ set in place and they have followed along. So nobody actually even pushed that on. And you could see this lesson in, in, in that history, which we just mentioned with the piracy. Uh, the Sahaba and the Tabi'in that came in, they engaged with these pirates, but they always pushed them back and never came with them. To the point they sacked a basis, you know, they came to Eritrea, they came to the, what is uh, today, other, uh, back in the day, called Adalus, but uh, modern day Masawa area stuff. They came and then the Halak Island, they came and they sacked it. And then they went back. They could have conquered it because the Halak Island is a very strategic area, you know, which we will see down the line uh, centuries later. That's fascinating because when we, when we hear, now we know that the early Muslim conquest did not go to West Africa. So that's out of the question altogether. Uh, so the closest region, if you talk of Africa, would have been East Africa. And we often hear the falsification of history that the Muslims, the Arab Muslims, raided African villages or kind of almost targeted black nations to take slaves. And here you're telling me that actually the state policy at the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and down the line was that we do not attack. The closest region in Africa, which is East Africa, there's no attack. And even when they come to us as pirates or they come to us in a provocative manner, we push, we repel them, but we do not pursue them into their land to conquer their land, which is a very interesting, uh, a very fascinating narrative, actually. Data and all the historical facts point towards that, to the point that most of the um, uh, uh, animistic uh, orientalists that were out there in the early 19th century and everything they wrote about the early seal of the Prophet Sallallahu categorically all of them mention that the exception was Ard al Habasha. The exception was Ard al Habasha. They did not go towards it for that purpose. And you will see it in, in, in that book, uh, that famous or quote unquote infamous book of uh, Islam in Ethiopia by, um, uh, what was the author's name? Um, I, uh, his name slips yeah, my mind at the moment. And the, the English uh, scholar who wrote uh, Islam in Ethiopia is in, in the 60s, I think it's in the 1950s and 1960s. He dedicates a whole section towards that. Uh, and most of the uh, German uh, Orientalists as well, they dedicate sections to that. And so the reason that they do that and, and specifically mention that is because for, for a factual study, if you just study that, you see throughout the engagement that the Sahaba, the Tabi'in, the Tab'a Tabi'in, as well as those people and states that came afterwards, they did not engage with the Horn of Africa in the sense of actually conquering. Because, you know, stone throw is Egypt, you know, through Sudan and Egypt, and the conquest happened. And then that conquest did not spill towards the, 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 the East, but it spilled towards the West. In the, the, the land of the Berbers, the land of North, uh, North Africa. It went all the way to Libya, Tunisia, you know, and then so on and so on and so on. So how come then if state policy wasn't in place, you know, when Amr ibn As and and Uqba and, and ibn Nafi and all these commanders who were the head of the generals of all these different colors, different uh, blacks from Africa, these people from uh, Northeast Africa, these people from Ard al Habasha, when they were part of his army and they were going against and pushing, why did they only push towards the West and Northwest, but not Northeast or East Africa? Which was closer. Hmm. So that actually debunks a very uh, popular 
lie that Islam preyed upon African villages. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions raided African villages. Factually, that never happened. Not only did, that, did it not happen, there was a policy against it. So it, was, it wasn't even something that was possible at all. A very unique instance in history, actually. Uh, so how did Islam actually spread then in East Africa? Was it, who brought Islam or who kind of, what was the agency involved in spreading and establishing Islam in East Africa if it wasn't the Arabs from uh, the peninsula? So it's uh, spread of Islam took um, in different stages in the Horn of Africa. Uh, the first stage was the stage that we just covered, which is the initial stage of hijrah, interaction, trade, dealing, exchange, because obviously a small minority community of Muslims developed in the Horn of Africa, uh, which were of indigenous people, but also people who came to trade. Because, you know, once you have a trade uh, um, link with people, they develop um, a relationship with you. They have agents, they have people that they actually put in place for that trade and so on, vice versa. And you would also do the same thing. And you would have agents in Aden, you would have agents in Zabid, you would have agents in Jeddah, you would have agents in Mecca, Medina, and so on and so on. And so through that trade developed this spread this casual spread of Islam. Mm -hmm. So yes, the early uh, vestiges of Islam, the early establishment of Islam, were there through the era of the Prophet Sallallahu but they were very nominal and they usually meant that they were with the powerful people, you know, the leaders and that type of things. So they were not with the laymen, they were not majority the laymen of the people. So gradually through trade, through interactions, Islam spread. Now, one of the things, again, that we uh, notice in, in the Horn of Africa, which could be said, uh, not necessarily completely unique, but it's, it's, there, is a, there is a case to be had in terms of saying that the spread of Islam was almost instantaneous. So it did not take that long for the masses to embrace Islam, for the interior to gain Islam. And the reason that we know now and we do not know previously is because these archaeological studies that have been done. So there's been a, a deep, deep in the interior in the Horn of Africa, such as like the uh, Somali uh, Peninsula, which is now the rest of the areas of uh, Harar, a little bit further than Harar, um, areas like in close to, um, basically where between the Oromo and the Somali people live, that is deep in the interior. We have archaeological uh, data now that there were mosques early on in the first century of Islam, that there were mosques there, that there were burial grounds, and to the numbers that there were actually quite a large numbers. So it's not like a small community that you had, say, if you had a traders, if you had people that were working with them, then that meant you had a small community, maybe 10 or 20 people in a village, maybe 100 or something. But these are beyond those numbers. Then you had graveyards that people have built. Then they did this, what's called the zoo archaeology, which is basically studying the, 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 the bones of the animals uh, that were slaughtered and ate. So there was no, um, the bones of pigs and stuff like that were very little. Mm -hmm. So the bones that were related to the animals that were halal, and there was a lot of signs of dabh. Mm -hmm. So there's when, when there's a signs of dabh and, 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 and the cutting of the uh, neck so that the blood can flow, there's again sign that this, be, uh, this is uh, Muslims. So all of these things are there to show that the gradual um, spread of Islam didn't take that long. It was very, fairly very quick. And the reason we know this, actually, and this helps again once more, is because in the biographical layers, in the books of the Tawakat and the, the, the scholars of Hadith, the scholars of Fiqh, the scholars of Tasawwuf, whatever Tawakat you were looking at, the biographical layers, we would find these names that relate to Zayla. We would find these names that relate to Habasha. We would find these names that relate to Muhdishi more and more and more. So in, we will find it in a, the tabaqat that are written by scholars that lived 2nd century Hijri, that was scholars that lived 3rd century Hijri, the scholars that were teachers to the Hadith scholars like Bukhari, for example, the scholars that were teachers to Imam Shafi'i, for example, you know, and, and, and so on and so on and so on. And these were not necessarily people who were, quote unquote, slaves, brought there, lived there, became Muslim, and then became advanced in the sciences of the, the, the deen, 
but there were people actually that came from the Horn of Africa, then established themselves in 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 these Islamic centers of the uh, of of the time. So the spread of Islam through that tracking model, we could see that the people actually embrace Islam. Once more, as, again, we, the reason we also know that many of these societies that were closest to the lands where Islam is now predominantly um, uh, practiced on. They, you can see, still see the majority of their people, majority of the indigenous are Muslims. So, for example, um, uh, northeast coast lines of 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 the Horn of Africa. If you see the 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 the, the largest group of Muslims are by far the Somalis, for example. Then you have the Afar. Then you have the Oromo. Then you have Allah Musta'an, you have some, some small numbers of then the other groups of people. Now, the reason that these groups of people are the largest Muslims in the Horn of Africa is because they dominantly live in the coastal lines. Mm -hmm. They dominantly have lived in the coast and they have dominantly engaged in the, in the trade of um, selling and buying camels, selling of buying livestock, living with the, with the land. So you would trade and then you live on the land. So you would go into the interior. So the more they went to interior to trade, the more they brought Islam into the interior. The more they practiced, the more their language got um, absorbed by Islamic terminologies, the more the culture became Islamic in itself. So when you study that again, once more, you see that these groups of people have had the earliest contact with Islam and continued with that to the point that the masses, the majority of them, the masses are, uh, in essence, culturally Muslims. So effectively, it was an organic, it wasn't imposed from external agents. It was the people themselves within that region who embraced Islam, as you mentioned, the aristocracy or the highly placed members of society. And then through trade and through interaction, will then convey their message to their own people. So it wasn't a foreign invasion of Arab Muslims coming across and just imposing Islam and taking slaves and taking them back to Mecca and Medina. But the picture you're painting here actually is very contrarian to what we're told in certain books and certain, certain uh, forums, that Islam was actually almost uh, preying upon the closest African nations in order to capture slaves and to convert them, to Arabize them effectively. Uh, so, Islam enters East Africa, it settles very early on, communities are built, cemeteries are available, masajid are built, we have this archaeological evidence of early Islam. How does that develop into sultanates? Because within that region we have several sultanates, in fact it's not something that is often mentioned in the wider narrative, but there have been several sultanates in East Africa with their own coins in certain cases, their own minting, their own uh, industries. Tell us a bit more about those. And why is it we don't hear about them? Reasons, I would say, not the reason, but one of the reasons is mainly because um, very little is left behind in terms of the, 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 the evidences. So the, the tangible materials. So when it comes to like masajids, for example, when it comes to royal courts, when it comes to manuscripts about the intrinsic, uh, runnings of these kingdoms and the build up to this, very little is left. Once again, though, through archaeological, um, uh, studies, there are now being um, massive cities and small cities and settlements that are being dug up out of out of the jungle, out of the desert, out of the out of the sand, because these places nobody has left for effectively for centuries. And so uh, you can see again once more in the coastal lines as well as the interior that many many of these settlements and masajids are being built. One of the reasons that is critical. Um, to, to understand this is some of the messages that you find again once more in the Horn of Africa are, and this is studies that they have done in terms of the messages, they tend to not have minarets. They tend to not have minarets. And this is a indication, a clear cut indication that they continue to following the old style of not having minarets in the messages. And those old buildings that still would have minaret here and there would have a singular minaret. So just, just one minaret. Once again, 
earliest indication that the minarets were uh, uh, just singular. They were never like two or three or four or five or the stuff that we see in the Ottoman Empire, for example, all these minarets popping up or in Cairo and everything else. So a lot of these things are popping up. But the sultanates, them, to come back to the sultanates themselves, the, we have the names, alhamdulillah. We have got details. We've got uh, some information here and there that pops up. The reason that these things do exist is because the information that has been left behind about them has been very minimal. And so the information that we now have more and more and that we're using as a secondary sources is through the names of individuals that pop up in history. So for example, if, if I would say to Ibrahim, you, I'll take you an example. You uh, lived in that sultanate, for example. You were grown up. Your family's from there. However, you left and then you lived now in Yemen. You settled in Yemen or you lived in the Hejaz or you lived in Syria or you lived in India, wherever that, that might be. However, you, some one of your uh, nicknames would be related to the sultanate that you came from, right? And then so therefore you retain that identity and that name and that would show in the books of biography and now then, then so roughly we would know okay we have 10 names we have three names we have five names we have six names they are crossed around that time, pe time period so therefore fairly we know around that time period that sultanate did exist that so then but that is as a secondary the primary uh, sources tend to be the information that we have in regards to saying for example like the shawa sultanate for example one of the earliest uh, sultanates that we have on record, which was around 4th century Hijri, which is actually the date that the sultanates rulers' names start popping up. So 4th century Hijri. However, that does not mean that's when the sultanate started, but the sultanate predates that. And so the names of the sultans that we have, which is an actually sultana, a lady, the first name that pops up is a, is a female lady that was a sultan is around the fourth century hijri 400 something if i'm not mistaken so 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 it was a female it was a sultanate in east africa where the leader was a woman yeah you 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 would have a lot of uh uh <laughs> um uh, there was at least four or five female sultanates wow. who uh, some were uh, de facto sultana and the others were um, actually, uh, they took power by themselves. But this is not, this is not strange. You will see even the, the wife of uh, Salah al-Din Ayyubi run after he died, effectively the Ayyubis, until it, it, it diminished and the, the, the Mamluks took really the power over. It was his wife that ineffectively ran uh, the, the, the Ayyubid dynasty after he passed away. So that's not something that people really talk about and, and mention. But there are uh, women who run the show behind the scenes, but there are also women who actually directly run the show mm. and do not want to think, run uh, things uh, behind, uh, sort of, you know, behind the screens. And this shows you the age old discussion of can a woman be a leader? And this is why the, the Fikri position become uh, more nuanced because they say, okay, this is, she's not a Khalifa. She's not a Khalif. But she is a effectively a a a a, a a a a a ruler of a province, a ruler of this. Those type of things are the, the, some of the stuff that the ulama have talked about, allowed or not allowed, and so the discussion varies on these things. Yeah. But in East Africa, I mean, befittingly, when we talk of the story of Belkis, whether she was from Yemen or from East Africa, that tradition that tradition was still alive. <laughs> Especially um, uh, that woman uh, that we just talked about, various other women, Imam Ahmed Kuri's wife, I don't know whether you have heard of yes. him, uh, uh, Garan, when he passed away, she took over power and effectively not, not his children, not anybody else. Uh, she took power and then it took later on his cousin, Imam Ahmed's cousin, to uh, basically negotiate with his wife to say, listen, I'm going to be avenging his death. I'm going to continue with the, the, the Futuah hat. I'm going to do everything required of a follow, following leader, the steps of the uh, uh, previous leader. I'm going to do that. And then so that's when she relinquished power to him yeah. by those magnets. So there's so many uh, stories on that. So is it possible to tell us uh, the names of some of these sultanates then in East Africa? 
happen. So uh, one of the earliest ones I mentioned earlier on was the uh, Shao um, uh, uh, dynasty, which is mainly uh, concentrated in what is today nearby Addis Ababa, uh, the, where the Amharic people live. Uh, it's stretched over all the way to the Eritrean coast. And that is, that's one of the sultanates. Some scholars, early scholars like uh, Yaqubi and others, they mentioned that the Halak Islands as a, a conglomerate of uh, a, a, a unified or cooperative unified islands that had their own powerhouses and therefore they became united as a sultanate. So that was known as the Tahlak Sultanate. And, and that's also early on, that's follows a similar time. Uh, what overthrew uh, the power of um, the Shawan uh, uh, principality was the, the, the rule of the Walashma dynasty or the, the Walashma dynasty, I don't know whether you're familiar with, uh, who lived in what was uh, previously in the domain or the rule of the Ifat Sultanate. So you had the Walashma family or the dynasty who came over and took over power uh, of the Ifat and they were actually also um, uh, collapsing. And those are some of the um, uh, sultanates that popped up in modern day Ethiopia. So those ones that I just mentioned specifically now, so far, are all found in modern day Ethiopia. So the state that we know today as Ethiopia. And then you have further north, northeast, what comes after that and takes uh, basically effectively power is the, um, uh, the Hadia dynasty, you have uh, the Bali dynasty, which is a mainly a Roman uh, country now. Uh, you had uh, the Adal dynasty, which is the Odal principality, which is the Somali dynasty, uh, which is uh, concentrated in the area of what is today Djibouti and, and Somaliland area. Uh, then continuing on on that, there is uh, Allah Musta'an. So many, Imam Muqrizi, he mentions uh, these books. Uh, the list of these uh, dynasties but on, on top of my head. I don't have all of them. Um, then you have Allah Musta'an. Um, I'll look them up for you in a minute. But um, that is the north northeastern. I'm, I'm forgetting I've at least four or five more dynasties there that are clustered together. And all of those are starting from the 4th, 4th century Hijri, roughly, uh, or about 4th century Hijri all the way to the 15th, uh, sorry, uh, all the way to the 9th to 10th century Hijri. So we're talking about a good span of six, 700 years that these dynasties have uh, independently or um, uh, simultaneously existed uh, with one another. Sometimes one dynasty observes the other because of power dynamics and everything else. Um, then you have then what is today located in uh, today, what we call uh, the Somali Peninsula, further into uh, where that tip of the horn is, basically, you have the Sultanates, which is the Ajuran Sultanates, which has been a huge, powerful uh, house uh, dating from, I would say, about uh, to modern estimate, uh, you would say, um, 10th, 11th century uh, CE, uh, 10th, 11th century CE. So that would mean. Uh, around 700 years, and, and they lasted till the 17th century to 18th century. And so that would be around 700 years. That would be perhaps maybe the longest running dynasty in the Horn of Africa uh, consecutively, but also the most powerful dynasty that existed in the Horn of Africa, uh, usually dominated the whole trade in the, uh, um, the Indian Ocean. Um, so that is uh, one of the most powerful hands. And then there's little sultanates that pop up in around the 16th, 17th, 18th century CE. And these are named after Somali clans. So you have the Majartan Sultanate, then you have the Wersangeli Sultanate, right? And you have the, uh, the Gadabursi Sultanate, which would be the Odal area that we just talked about. Uh, then you have uh, in way, way down in the south, where the people that are called the Rewin live, who live of farming uh, industry and uh, water aggregation and everything else. You have their sultanates that pops up uh, around that time. And so those are the things that are focused then in that part. Then you have the Swahili. <laughs> those are too many to name, you know, it's like the Kilwa Sultanate and, and so on and so on. So that's not even... 
uh, I can't even start on that. That's uh, completely so. From there, you could name around fifty sultanate, forty yeah. sultanate, just concentrated in that part of the world. And were these sultanates at any point under the uh, uh, under the under the authority of the Abbasid or Umayyad, or were they completely independent sultanates? Were they under the Khilafah of the Arab? Uh... So, for the most part, we do know that. Um, here and there, um, some of the sultanates become um, uh, 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 some sort of accept regional. They accept uh, the 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 power above them. Basically, some of the sultanates. So, so it's throughout history. So you see, for example, in Ifat, one of the powerful dynasties we mentioned earlier on, Ibn Fadl al Umari. Who wrote Masalik al Amsar from Mamalik al Absar, uh, which is a 17 volume work on the history of Islam and the dynasties of Islam? Who, and he was writing this in the 1330s, around about Ibn Battuta's time. So he was writing at that time. And so he mentions that the Ifat and all the other dynasties around Ifat, which were Muslim sultanates, they came under the Najash, they came after, uh, under the Christian. As uh, 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 king or the Christian emperor, because they were not strong enough individually to um, go against them, right? They they would have a little bit of uh, you know sometimes they would have a rebellion, sometimes they would fight them. So, but they came under them. They, they accepted their um, uh, um, their rule as a were, right? You know, over it. But sometimes they weren't. So they fights break out, wars break out, and these wars last 40 years, 30 years, and then they spill over, and that's when things happen that are horrible. And uh, that's where also a lot of the slavery that happened came from, not because of Arabs, but because of these Christian, uh, uh, Christian um, uh, Horners or, or, or Africans and the Muslim Africans that are fighting with one another. Mm. And then therefore they capture and then they see these people as commodity and economy. So this happened. And then sometimes also, you know, when the Ottomans come to the Horn of Africa, they, in essence, incorporate uh, the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea coast, which was known as the uh, Ottoman Habash or Habash Ottoman, because of the Hajman, uh, the reason that they named that way, because it is channel. You know the Suez Channel and and the importance of the Red Sea as a trade uh, hub. So they were based in Aden. So they they took that on, and for a good century, century and a half, uh, the Ottomans basically ruled that strip of the coastal area. Uh, you had also before them the Abbasids, uh, Harun al-Rashid, who sends letters and envoys to Mogadishu, saying. Okay, now I need to make sure that the Mogadishu's uh, viability and economic uh, powerhouse and people are migrating, people are developing businesses, there are armies that come from it, actually uprisings come from it. So I need to now make sure that these people swear filthy, that they take bear under me and that they actually accept my rule. And one of the famous incidents that happens is they reject his rule. <laughs> they reject his rule. And then therefore he sends an army and, and attachment of arms. So how can you reject my rule? I'm the Khalif in essence. But essentially what happens then by the time that the army comes and their commander arrives, uh, from that uh, part of the world, people have already sort of simmered down and was like, okay, no, you accept your rule. And then all the army does is leave behind uh, uh, ulama, the people who actually teach the, the Quran and everything else, and then they sort of leave back. But then they have their own little base, their military base, just to guard the Red Sea uh, from piracy and all the insecurities that happens. And this is why essentially we have the early minarets in the Horn of Africa. They pop up because of this incident, yeah, because of the Abbasid and the Umayyads before them actually wanted a watchtowers where the, actually the coast can be actually supervised and guarded against invading forces. And so that's why they put these, these minarets that actually do not exist anymore, but some there, there do exist, some do exist in Mogadishu, some exist in Kismayo, some do exist in Eritrea uh, and Masawa areas, some exist in Djibouti, so, although they, they're not as old as we would like them, but it's, you can see the style and the fashion and the design, they kept, you know, building based on the original format and original architecture, which was the Omeyyad and Abbasid early dynasties.
Yeah. Fascinating stuff. And you mentioned Mogadishu being a trade hub or a place of significance politically, strategically, and culturally. Tell us a bit about Mogadishu because we hear a lot about um, figures such as Saeed of Mogadishu. And he's, in captiv he's captivated the attention of many people because of his legendary journeys into the East and other parts of the world. Oftentimes uh, characterized as being the first African ambassador in the Far East. Uh, tell us a bit about him and his, his, his career, his trajectory. Area Seyun and all these areas. Now, one of these scholars is uh, by the name of um, uh, Abu Bakr, Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, if I'm not mistaken. Around the end of 5th century, around about 600 something Hijri, 600 something, yeah, Hijri, he travels. This guy is a celebrated faqih, celebrated hadith scholar, celebrated in tasawwuf and ilm and all But he is a, what we call in, 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 in when it comes to giving people names, Shafi'i Qur, like Shafi'ism is like in his bones and in his bone marrow. The world studied by that. He basically leaves Yemen, which is at that time also a huge center for Shafi'i Fiqh. You know, it's all the books that we have in that time period is either from Yemen or either from Persia. No doubt from that, you know. So he leaves that place and he wants to go to Mogadishu. And he says, in, and in the biographical layers, we have that uh, anecdote. He says, I want to go to Mogadishu because I've heard that a couple of scholars have actually went there and they studied the Wasit, which is by Imam Al-Ghazali. So Imam Al-Ghazali by then has died uh, 60 years before him, before this story kicks off, around 60, 70 years before that. So Imam Al-Ghazali's Wasit, Imam, uh, um, Imam Shirazi's uh, Muhaddab and Imam Shirazi's uh, Tanbi, they have studied these three books in a year. So Wasit and Basit, if any, your listeners who are Shafi'i uh, students of knowledge or ulama even know that multi-volume works they are like the end of it all you know this is like not a book you just pick up to study <laughs> but he's saying people actually go to Mogadishu to study those books those four books so four major what Imam Nawi calls the five binnacle books in our madhab Imam Nawi calls it so he wants to go and study that in Mogadishu in one year is that, is that possible? That's what he's wondering. And that's what the anecdote of the biographical layers are telling us. Is that possible? Can such a thing, can such a feat be done? And so he says, I'm going to put that to the test and I want to go and study in Mogadishu. And what do you know? He comes to Mogadishu, he finds a scholar celebrated for actually teaching all four school, all four books. And he indeed studies with him in a year. Indeed goes back in Yemen saying like, I've, I've, I've completed that task. And this is one of those phenomenal uh, stories that you have. And that is just one, but one of the most phenomenal stories in that time period of Saeed Mogadishu that, uh, that he'd left. <laughs> 